It's October. Welcome to the Teens Cornerstone Connection lesson. This month, we begin a new quarter with the theme, Reality Bible. With Shani on the mission story, Amy on the violin, Joyce appealing to the deaf community, Steve, Seth, Misati, and our wonderful teachers as our panelists. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Shani. I'm going to be reading the mission story. And our story comes from Cameroon. It's about an 11 year uh, a small, a young girl named Emmanuel. A 10 year old Emmanuel was sound asleep in bed in the African country of Cameroon. But the dream was like real life. In the dream, Emmanuel saw a woman speaking with men with long knives. Go, the woman said to them. Then she spoke directly to Emmanuel. I'm sending my sons to get you, she said. Emmanuel saw the men coming toward her, and she felt a sharp pain. Then she woke up. She was scared and crying. While she couldn't see anything in the dark bedroom, she could still hear the voice of the woman. I'll send my sons to get you. I will send my sons to get you. Emmanuel struggled to breathe. But suddenly, mother and father were standing over her bed. They heard her sobbing in the next room while sleeping, and they dropped on their knees beside their bed. Our Lord, our God, we give you glory because you have allowed us to have this child, mother prayed. Now we are presenting her to you. We pray that the enemy will be sent far away from her and that she will be restored in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. When mother finished praying, Emmanuel could breathe again. Her tears stopped and she no longer felt afraid. Emmanuel told her parents about the scary dream. She thanked mother for praying. I know that God will answer your prayer, she said. After her parents left, Emmanuel prayed silently. She had learned to pray when she was little. But she had been so scared that she had forgotten to pray. Lord, I want you to help me, she prayed. I pray that you confuse those who want to destroy me. Fight for me forever and ever. Amen. Then she fell asleep. But the next night, she had the same dream again. Again, she saw the woman and she felt the pain. She woke up scared and crying. She couldn't breathe. Mother and father rushed to the bedroom. Mother prayed and Emmanuel could breathe. The dream repeated the next night and the next. She had the same dream every night for two weeks. Emmanuel became scared to go to bed at night. Mother didn't know what to do, so she went to the church pastor. When the church pastor heard about the dreams, he organized a special time of prayer for Emmanuel. He and several church elders came to Emmanuel's home and prayed for her. It was then that the bedroom, the bad dream stopped. Sorry. Emmanuel doesn't understand why she kept having bad dreams after she prayed. She didn't understand why she she didn't understand why she did the bad dream stopped after the pastor and elders prayed. But she does understand that God heard all their prayers and that there's something special about the intercessory prayer when people are praying for someone else. A year has passed since the bad dream and Emanuela is no longer afraid of going to bed. I have the assurance that any time I call upon the name of the Lord, he will be there to answer me, Emmanuel says. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he helps us. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a Seventh-day Adventist school in Cameroon where children will be able to learn about God who takes away bad dreams. Thank you for your generous offering.
Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, 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 and karibu sana uh, to our lesson study, cornerstone study this week. It's such a joy to have you, and uh, we have a wonderful lesson prepared for you. But before we start, uh, perhaps I'll just give an opportunity for my co-panelists here to introduce themselves. And we'll start from my extreme right. Um, good evening, uh, good afternoon. Good morning um, from wherever you're watching. My name is Seth Ruben Makaya, and I'm happy to be here. Fantastic. I am Ms. Sati Nyambane, and I'd love to welcome you for another banger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve, and I'm so happy to be here with us today. Uh, great, great. My name is Bismarck Lumumba, and before we start, perhaps let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, O oh Lord God, we come before you, Father, this time. We'd like to thank you so much for another opportunity, O oh Father, to study your word. O oh Father, please, how I ask that you may help us, O oh Father. Help us to understand. Help us to be able to see. Help us, Father, in every way. Be with us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a wonderful lesson uh, entitled, Turn It Around, Turn It Around. Um, and just to start us off, we're going to start off with a question, uh, just to find out what you think, what you think. Uh, and, I, and I want to involve my co-panelists here. Uh, have you ever done something, or have you ever made a decision, and uh, you think that there are no consequences? Uh, or you think that, you know, the consequences here, if there are any, they'll be very minimal, you know? Or maybe they'll be delayed, you know? Or... <laughs> You've done something, and immediately you know <laughs> that the consequences are immediate. I don't know. Uh, what would you guys say? Would you, would, you, would you tell us some of the decisions that you have made, perhaps, um, where you think that you know, the, the consequences are either delayed, or immediate, or there are no consequences at all? Okay, so I, I jump in and I'd say like one particular thing. It's like when I never used to have like a consistent sleeping schedule, mm -hmm. it would be delayed. But then when the consequences is hit, they hit hard. Ah, like, because in the morning, I'm like, ah, uh, is it morning? Yeah. What's happening? Yeah. Like that sort of thing. Like, yeah. You know, a lot of times we think that, you know, especially when you're young, you think that you can stay awake forever, <laughs> you know, and yeah. there'll be no consequences. But then it actually catches up with you, right? Mm. All right. What, what do you guys think? Okay. Mine is a funny one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you forget to pray for your food. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so you're, like, you're in the process of eating, and then you just realize, yeah. then you're, you're stuck with yourself. Like, yeah. I haven't prayed today. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you say, are there, are, there, are there any consequences for not praying for your food? Huh? <laughs> I, I think the thing would be, it's like, are there any, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe. Really? Okay. I'm, I'm wondering, would, would there actually be a consequence? It's not like you're going to get bad gas because you yeah. haven't said the grace. Or, or diarrhea. For your food or diarrhea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because if the food is, is it's going to give you diarrhea, it's going to give you diarrhea. Yeah. Okay. Maybe God can like cleanse the food or whatever. Yeah. But I think the thing is, if you do forget to say the grace, at the end say, thank you, Jesus, please bless the food as it sits in my stomach. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, for the next meal, you're like, oh, I never prayed for the previous meal. So, thank you, God, for the food that just digested and the one I'm about to digest. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yes. fair enough, fair yeah. Enough. So, you know, and, and the reason why I ask this question is because in the lesson that we are trying to learn today, you know, there are times that we do things and we think that there, there won't be any consequences, you know. There are times that we do things and we think, hmm, well, uh, it's going to be all right anyway. We can just skip over, you know. But that's not the case. That's not the case. As we're going to see in the story, and I just want to invite uh, Misati just to take us briefly through the story uh, and we, so we can see if there are consequences to the actions that were purported herein. Yeah, and the story starts out with the Israelites and the Philistines. Mm -hmm. Such an interesting wrangle. Mm -hmm. Now, the, Phil the Israelites, yes, are at Ebenezer. The Philistines are at Afek. Mm -hmm. Now, they go to war, and I wonder why they went to war with the Ark of the Covenant. Anyway, they went to, to war with it, interestingly enough. Uh, they probably thought it, there would be any consequences. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so there, were, there, there are no consequences. So they went to war with it, an odd habit, yeah. honestly. So they went to war with the Ark of the Covenant. Then, during the war, the Israelites were soundly beaten. That's 30,000 men were killed. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the Philistines took possession of the Ark, 
And then they now place it in the temple of Dagon. I think mm. Dagon was some fish god. Mm-hmm. Looked like a fish or a mermaid or a maman man <laughs> or something. <laughs> Looked like a maman yeah. and that sort of thing. So they placed the Ark of the Covenant with Dagon right there. Just let me stop you right there. Yeah. Do you think that that might be where uh, the legend of mermaids come from? Uh, it's a possibility. It's a possibility, isn't it? It's a possibility. Because that but, thing looks yeah. like that. But yeah. for, Dagon, for Dagon, I think the fish was on top and then the bottom was a man. No, or something was, like that. Yeah. Was, I remember reading it was the, the top was a man ah. and the bottom was a fish. The bottom, just like a mermaid? Yes, just or, like a mermaid. Okay, I think in this case it's a man. It's a mama. Yeah. A man. Yeah. Mama. A mama. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so as it, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I was to correct you on something, uh, when you talked about the if Israelites going to war with the Ark of the Covenant, first of all, they hadn't gone with it. They had gone without consulting God. Ah. Then they, they realized they were losing the battle. So eventually, they they sent someone to come for the Ark of the, co- with, uh, with the, with Ark the, Ark of the Covenant. Covenant. And when okay. it arrived, remember there was a great shout. Even ah. the Philistines were scared. Ah, they thought they were going to win now. They thought they were uh-huh. going to win yeah. because they now viewed, they act with them. Yeah, they viewed the Ark like God, like a God. Okay. Yeah, and now when they went to war, of course, as you said, they were soundly and soundly, soundly beaten. Thirty thousand men dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. And, and right there, so they placed Dagon and the Ark mm. in the same place. Then overnight, they wake up in the morning and they find that Dagon's arms have been broken, mm-hmm. and then it's just like only his body has remained and he's lying on the floor. And they're like, "Wait, what's happening?" Mm-hmm. You know, and I think they were even scared that hey. Like this God of these Israelites, mm-hmm. though he never saved them in war, he enabled them as this broke our God. Mm-hmm. So they're like, let's place this God. And, and the interesting thing is that God struck these people mm-hmm. with tumors. Oh my goodness. Struck them with tumors. And for them, they, they had this belief that if you have an illness and you make a model of the illness, the illness goes away. So they actually had made gold tumors and gold rats. Mm-hmm. So they placed the Ark of the Covenant with gold tumors and gold rats and then sent it on its way. Mm-hmm. Now, towards the border of Beth Shemesh. Now, at the border of Beth Shemesh, there were people there who were curious. Because you just see some, you see a golden looking ark with some rats and some tumors beside it. And then you're like, okay, let me go peep. So they go <laughs> peep like this and they're like, hey. they were struck. And like 70 people were just struck dead right there and then. Mm-hmm. Because of their sort of curiosity, so to speak. And that's, that sounds. It seems cruel, but mm-hmm. it's like they never knew any better, but mm-hmm. you're dead. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that's the thing. So then the Israelites do get their covenant back, their mm-hmm. ark back. Mm-hmm. And once they get it back, they're like, Samuel, please, so, so we are ready to go back to, to our God. God. Mm-hmm. And so what does Samuel do? Samuel decides to set up a memorial mm-hmm. between Mizpah and Shen. Mm-hmm. And name and Named it Ebenezer, this far the Lord has mm. brought us. Mm. That is, and from then on, the Israelites were def- the Israelites overcame and the Philistines were defeated. Wow, wow, what a story. And you tell it so well. Um, and, and here we have so much going on. We have so much going on. So maybe we can just break it down uh, a little bit. Eh? Um, so you've told us about uh, the god Dagon and the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant. Eh? And I just wanted to ask you, what is the significance? What's the meaning? Now that you, know, you told us that you know, the heart was broken, um, uh, what, what was actually going on there? Yeah. I think it just shows, it just clearly displays uh, the, the power of God, mm-hmm. that God is just saying there is no other God like me. Yeah. And that is, and in essence, what we could see is like Dagon was just some weird uh, demon-like entity somewhere mm-hmm. made that looked like that or maybe assumed that form. Mm-hmm. I think God showed that even in the hands of pagans, mm-hmm. he still shows his power. He's still God. He's still Indeed. God. You know, and so, and so you know the... The Philistines, as you rightly put it, the Philistines had put the Ark of the Covenant and their God side by side, you know. And they were saying, oh, you know, because Tagudago now was looking upon the Ark of the Covenant. And if you remember how the Ark of the Covenant was structured uh, in the book of Deuteronomy and Exodus, you remember the, there was the, the, the two angels and then in the, there was the most holy place there in the middle, you know. And so now Dagon was looking at it. And in the morning when they come, they find that it's on its face and the hands have been broken, you know, and they wonder what's going on. You know, they can't really tell. Uh, another aspect of the story uh, that you brought up, Steve, was, uh, you know, how the Israelites related to the box, or rather to the Ark of the Covenant. Huh? How did they relate to the box? Uh, because at, at this time, I don't know if it represented God uh, mm. to them as much as it should have. Uh, maybe you can comment about that, and then Mr. you can come in. 
Yeah, um, I believe they viewed it as more of a God with a small G, of course. Uh, uh, because that the God had taken his presence from them, mm -hmm. you see. And first of all, they didn't go into the world without consulting God. Mm -hmm. So that was already a bad thing to do, mm -hmm. you see. They are not consulted God or something. Yeah. And then they, when they saw that they were being beaten, yeah. they thought that the Ark could help them get rescued ah. and win the war okay. against the Philistines. Yeah. And so you find that... Uh, they viewed it as more of a god, yeah. as like the ark is what will save them, yeah. rather and than, not God. Rather than being God himself yeah. as the person who will save them from yeah. their enemies. Yeah, it reminds me of the verse that says, you know, I am the Lord God and my glory I shall not give to another. Um, very true, very true. Um, now, the last part that you've brought out of the story is uh, Samuel, you know, and sort of asking for the turnaround. Eh? And I'd just like to refer uh, Seth uh, Seth, if you could read for us the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 3. And this is really our key text, actually, for this week. The book of 1 Samuel, chapter 7, and verse 3. Go right okay. ahead. Um, 1 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 3. It says, And Samuel speak, spoke unto, unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord, with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and astronaut as from, mm -hmm. from among you. Prepare your hearts and ha hearts unto the Lord and save him only. Serve him only. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Israelites. So. Philistine. So what I get from this um, uh, key text is that um, remember the Philistines had uh, an affair with the Israelites and before that um, I guess where this part where God says that um, the Philistines had a mighty God and that God was actually an idol, that God with small g. And we are specifically told that we should not bow down to any other gods but him. Yet the Philistines decided to uh, create a God that's the God of Dagon, the God called the Dagon, that he will he will actually answer their prayers, their prayers. And it was not actually true that Dagon actually answered their prayers. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Seth. Uh, but before we actually interrogate that, something has just come to mind from out of the story. Sorry that we did not cover it. And it's the people of Beth Shemesh that you actually told us. Oh. <laughs> and looking into the... Looking into the, the <laughs> The chest, you know, and you, I think you dramatized it very well, you know, the chest comes and they peep. <laughs> Maybe perhaps you can just illustrate that yeah, for and, us. And I think the thing is, it just yeah. seems, it, it just is like, I think that's like Uza. Uza like was like, yeah. Aki is going, then like, ooh, then pa. As yeah. if so the Ak rectifies itself and the yeah. man just drops dead to the ground. Yeah. I think these people, they were, they were curious. Yeah. Because I think they had had some legends like, oh, Aaron's run that budded. Yeah. Oh, the, 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 ten the, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Well, and then, yeah. they, then they see like the pot of manna. I'm the like, pot of manna. Hey, even I would want to see manna. That would never go bad. <laughs> <laughs> even I would want to see manna. Yeah. But I think the thing is, for them, they regarded it as something like secular. Come on. Yeah. As in, it's mm. like, hey, like, it's just like when you see, if it's not something you're used to, it's like, <laughs> I think it's, it's like what? When you hear, oh, a certain musician is coming and like, hey, I want to see. Yeah. I mean, and, you're, and you're around. Or yeah. if, if there's like, they say if there's a football match and you know you can't get in, you yeah. have an opportunity, like a small peak. And like, yes, I, I must see. Let, yeah. let me see this player. Let me they, see. They, so they peeped. You know. they, they peeped. They were like, yes, let's, let's take a look. Yeah. And at that point, by taking it, by not regarding it as yeah. holy, yeah. they were struck. Yeah. Not, if, I might, if I might add also. Go, go ahead. Like, you've talked about the case of Uza. For him, it was more of uh, trying to save the Ark of the Covenant, mm. but uh, he was unfairly struck down I, mm. I, I, from you, uh, my side. Yeah. Uh, but for the case of the Israelites, you know, 
the loss of the covenant, the sad, the whole no. Then it shows up, right? Out of nowhere with bulls, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone is excited, everyone is excited. Then, you know, you always have this one friend who loves taking risks. You yeah, know? you say, let's, let's, yeah, let's, yeah, let's, 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 let's try it and see, you know. Let's, let's see what's inside there. What's the worst that could happen, you know? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and they were struck. And then they were struck, and, yeah. But I think, I think the key thing to distinguish is that although it was not God, God, it was a holy object, right? And God took it seriously when you tried to profane it, you know? Even Uza, you know, even Uza, he had been instructed. They had been instructed for a very long time. I know you said, you know, probably you see that it might be a little bit unfair, you know, it was toppling over. And David gets very scared, and that's in a later chapter. But then, you know, he, here, you know, here you see that, that these guys are actually joking. They're actually playing with an object which God has said is holy, you know? And yeah. I think the thing is, the Bible is not very descriptive. Yeah. But I mean, if we were just like to subject it to a human way we would behave, yeah. it's like you're just saying, like, let's then, what, what good example can there be? Oh, let's say, for example, yeah. it's like the ark comes with a, an open cabriolet or an open sports car, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And it's just cruising around town slowly. Like, yeah. And you can actually see the ark. So just cruising around town, so you're like, hey, what's, what's this? Yeah. It's like, what's this? Yeah. So then they decide to make it a show, so like yeah. a freak show. Yeah. Like, he's a box that has rats yeah. and tumors. Yeah. Wow. I yeah. mean, yeah. of course, that, that seems crazy. You know, it's like, it, yeah. like, what? It, it, I, you know, the way I saw it, it's sort of like human mischief. It's just yeah. you uh, being mischievous, you know. But, yeah. You know, it's you playing, really, with the, the things of God. Yeah, go ahead. Interestingly, uh, if you look at the, the into the story, yeah. like the verse itself, there's a, there's a verse which says, but God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. Now, if you think about it, 70 people looking into a box. <laughs> like, it, it just seems... Have you... Like, no, 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 have like, you... Have you, have you, you know, <laughs> I, you know, you know, I, I actually resonate with this verse. Yeah. You know, have you ever noticed that whenever you're with your friends, you're just a little bit more rowdy? Yeah. 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 You know, whenever you're alone, you wouldn't do those things, you know. You'd have a bit more respect. But no, you're 70 people and you're thinking, ah, no. Iki to Tufungwe. No, I'm wondering, uh, how did they get, because 70 of them looked, it, yeah. they looked and they got struck. See, some of other people would have noticed and then. Yeah, no, it's, then, you know, it's, it's in the verse that you read, actually, it follows, you know, the people mourned because of the heavy blow that the Lord had. You know, so when those 70 people died, you can imagine, if, you know, it, I'm thinking about it like a traditional village, you know, mm. probably your brother would be there, your sister would be there. They went, they looked, and, yep. you know, they were, yeah. they were struck. So now yeah. you have a mass funeral in Beth Shemesh just for that little thing. Huh? Yeah, but now let's move on to, to, to the key text that uh, Seth read eh? very well, and even he elaborated on it. Eh? Um, and it's really the essence of our lesson today. And it's that... Uh, once all these things had happened, you know, they had been fighting for over 20 years. They had been fighting with the Philistines. Previously, they had judges, you know. Uh, they had Eli's bad sons, you know. They have just been in a turmoil, tumultuous, you know, sort of environment, you know. And now Samuel has finally come of age. In fact, this is that maybe the third page of First Samuel. Eh? Now he has come of age, and, you know, the Israelites are experiencing a sort of revival. Eh? There's, a, there's a revival in it, you know. And just as the text said, I'll just read it again, uh, although Seth had read it earlier. He says, So Samuel said to all Israelites, to all the Israelites, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods, the Ashtoreths, you know, and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines, right? And so they have just witnessed this great miraculous victory. The ark has been brought back, you know, there's, there's peace for over 20 years. And now Samuel comes up and he's saying, if you guys, if you guys have really decided to follow God, yeah, then remove all the other foreign gods, all the other false gods, yeah, and serve him, and he will deliver you even further. Um, Having said that, I just want to bring in Steve on yes. the flashlight mm -hmm. uh, and just tell us what the spirit of prophecy says about this. Okay, if I can read from the flashlight. Uh, it mm. says, there is, no, there is need today of such a revival of true heart religion as was experienced by ancient Israel. Repentance is the first step that must be taken by all who would return to God. No one can do this work for another. We must individually humble our souls before God and put away our idols. When we have done all that we can do, the Lord will manifest to us his salvation. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very true. And this is really just, uh, you know, telling us that, uh, you know, we, we, we ought to individually humble ourselves. Eh? And really, just as Samuel was saying, just to turn back uh, uh, from our sins, uh, as it were. Um, before we read the punchline, just let's get a little bit of insight uh, on, a, on the discussion that we're having prior uh, from the did you know part. Uh, Misati, if you could just read the, the did you know, did you know about the, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the Ark so, of the Covenant and what it was. So this yeah. Ark of the Covenant was a sacred box that God had told Moses to build. It was made of wood, acacia wood, specific, mm -hmm. and covered in gold. On the top of the box sat two gold covered angels with their wings raised facing each other. God's glory and presence dwelled between the angels. God was very particular about the Ark of the Covenant. It was housed in the most holy place. No one was to look at it except the high priest once a year. When he traveled, it had to be wrapped in a veil, hmm, badger skin, and a blue cloth to keep it hidden from human eyes. To keep it hidden from human eyes. So you can just imagine the transgression of these guys from Beth Shemesh eh, to actually open and look at it. I don't know if they succeeded. The Bible doesn't say if they succeeded, you know. They said, you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, they looked into the ark. You know, they just, I don't know if they succeeded in looking into it, but, you know, you can just see how important it was. It. So right now I just want to bring in Seth uh, once again, just with some of the punchlines. Uh, um, and just in relation to this story, uh, Seth, if you could read, and maybe we can do it all together. Uh, yeah, if you could yeah. read for us uh, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, it's right at the top at the les in the lesson. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. It says, Repentance that leads to salvation and leaves on no reject to the, but worldly sorrow brings death. Mm -hmm. what, what I get from here is... Um, Let's say if you have rejected most of your friends who do drugs and such stuff that you're not supposed to to take at our young age, even if you know, even if you're in that age of taking that drug of which it's supposed to like let me take alcohol as an example. When they advertise alcohol, they usually say that um, alcohol not suitable for the pe children under the age of 18. I think it's not right to take alcohol at that age because it, it will affect your body and eventually you can die because of taking alcohol or smoking because um, smoking, it really affects a part of your lungs. And if your lungs block all of a sudden, you won't be able to breathe. And by the time you call for help, eh, you're already halfway dead. Gory. You're already halfway dead. That is like the effects of smoking a lot of weed, as, a, as an example, because weed is most popular, used all over the world. All right, Seth, I'm going and to bring you... Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I get, I get what you're saying. I'm going to bring you a little bit back, yeah? But this is a very good verse that you've read, actually, yeah? When it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death, right? Mm -hmm. And so here, in the, in, in, even in the story and the key text that we've just read, yeah, uh, what... What uh, Samuel is asking the people, the children of Israel to do, really, is to repent and to return to God. Eh? And this verse particularly tells us that, you know, um, such repentance brings about salvation, right? It actually will save you, you know, and it has no regret. You won't even regret it. You won't even be like, oh, no, I shouldn't have. You'd, it brings about salvation, you know. But we're told that worldly sorrow, worldly sorrow brings about death while the sorrow brings about death. And I don't know, I've had quite a few friends. I had, at least I can think of one friend who committed suicide, you know. And, you know, that's just a good example of worldly sorrow that leads to death. All right. Uh, I can add Sure, um, go ahead. This verse has reminded me of something I read in the Spirit of Prophecy. It was about, uh, I'm mainly going to focus on the godly sorrow part. Mm -hmm. When uh, 
the Israelites, when the Ark of the Covenant returned and the Israelites realized what they had done, mm. they wanted to go back to God, mm. you see. And so through the help of Samuel, they were mm. able to repent and they were able to, get, to go back to God and they were restored, yeah. you see. And this is an example of godly sorrow because mm. they realized the sin of their error. Mm. They realized the sin of their ways. Mm. And uh, thus it brought them back to God the way the verse clearly states. Very true. Yeah. Very true. And that's, a, that's you know, I think you've said it very well. Uh, Misati, perhaps if you could read for us uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now. Let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, before I invite you just to comment on that verse, you know, it, it, it's saying that really, you know, God is looking for us to repent. He's actually, it's an invitation. It's an open invitation for us to repent. And he says, you know, though your sins are like scarlet, you know, though you might have done the unthinkable, though you might have done the unthinkable, you know, he's willing to forgive. Perhaps maybe what, what, what have you gotten from the verse yourself? So I think the thing would be, like, God is saying, come now, let us, not let him. Mm. As in, says, like, let us reason. Mm -hmm. Let us logically think this through that you may be doing this. You may desire to do this. But now the question is, like, let's see, is what I'm offering you better than what you are trying to offer yourself? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that your sins, what you're trying to do, though they may be a scarlet, though they are tainted, impure, and mud, mm -hmm. like I can do something better. Mm -hmm. I can do one better mm -hmm. than what you can do. Amen, amen, and that's so true. Uh, uh, Steve, if you could read for us uh, the book of Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It's the very last verse there. Mm -hmm. It says that, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal the land. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you know, just before I invite you as well, just to comment on that, mm -hmm. you know, this is an, it's an open invitation. You know, God is saying that he will hear from heaven. You know, he will, he's listening. He's listening. He will hear from heaven and he'll forgive their sin and he will heal their land. I don't know what stands out to you from that verse. Well, what stands out to me is the aspect of humility. Mm -hmm. That to go before God, we need to reduce as, uh, as man. We need to lower our ego and we need to present ourselves to God mm -hmm. in the most humble manner. Mm -hmm. That way he can be able to hear us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true. As we almost come to the conclusion, uh, Misati, if you could just read for us the further insight. Uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Steps to Christ by Ellen G. White. As we draw near to him with confession and repentance, he will draw near to us with mercy and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And it's just, again, another promise from God. You know, ladies and gentlemen, really, God is really looking. He's, he's constantly soliciting us just to reach out to him. You know, when you solicit, eh? when, you, when, <laughs> when you solicit, eh? You do everything. You litigate, you arbitrate, you mediate, you negotiate, you even threaten sometimes, you know, just to say, come, come. I, all I want is you. All I want is you. And, and this is really just what we want. Um, we'll move on to the Friday part. And uh, I'd just like, uh, uh, Seth, perhaps, if you could read for us the book of Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. It's, unfortunately, it's not there. If you have your Bible, you can just turn uh, with us to the book of Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. Are you there? The so Proverbs 16, 3. Ah, uh, go ahead. Yes. Put God in charge of your work. Mm -hmm. Then what you have planned will take place. Mm -hmm. Put God, that's such a powerful verse. You know, 16 verse 3, it says, my verse says, commit thy works unto the Lord. But I like the way it says, put God in charge. Mm -hmm. Put God in charge. Let him be the managing partner. You know, let him be the CEO. Let him be the one to say what happens, you know. And then what, what, what's the promise that comes there? And then, thy? Then what you have planned will take place. Then what you have planned will take place. Is there any other sure word, you know, for you to be successful? What do you need to do? Put God in charge of your work. Put God in charge of your work. Huh? Yes. Really, you know, and it's a, it's a promise that we have been given, you know. And the lesson is just trying to tell us, and this is really Samuel's call, eh? that if we are able to 
turn around if we are able to say with confidence, right, that God is in charge, you know, and put God first, then we shall experience success. Uh, I'll just read the Friday part. It says, uh, you know, when we turn from doing things our way and begin doing them God's way, God will bless us, you know. He blessed, the Israels with de- he, he blessed Israel with deliverance from the Philistines when Israel repented. They were heard by God and were helped by God. All right, all right. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, I think really we have come to the end of our lesson. But uh, I just want to give maybe two minutes, two to three minutes each, just for uh, our panelists, just to tell you really what they have learned from this lesson, really, and, uh, and uh, what has really stood out for them. So we'll start at the very end there uh, with Seth. Seth, what have you learned in this lesson? What, would you like, what message would you like to pass on, and uh, what can you really say as a closing uh, parting shot? Um, I think my parting shot is... Um Whenever you're in trouble or whenever you may need something, um, just go direct to God because you might be in trouble and you don't know how to solve it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And remember, God is that kind of person who when you ask him anything, he might say yes no or wait but if it's that serious um you can just say he can just say okay i'll i'll grant your your wish as the way he granted hannah's wish to have to have been given back to somewhere yeah yeah thank you so much Go ahead. the thing that strikes me is Right here, consequences. Mm-hmm. Consequences can be nice, or consequences can be bad. Mm-hmm. At times, consequences can happen, at times, consequences can be delayed. And that is, and notwithstanding, God offers a bar, He offers a requirement. He's like, mm-hmm. you need to repent, you need to turn away from your sins. Mm-hmm. In short, He's just saying, you know, you guy, or you girl, mm-hmm. do this, leave the lack, leave the many devices you're. You're seeking. I think that's where Solomon jumps in and he says, like, God has made man upright, but man has sought many devices. In short, God has just said, you know what? The way I've made you, if you follow the exact blueprint of how I made you and live your life with the blueprint I'm offering you, mm-hmm. you'll be happy. Mm-hmm. You won't be worrying, like, hey, what, what if, what if, whatever, whatever. No, you'll walk with, like, confidence. You'll walk like you know what you're doing without second guessing you yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. Like you may make mistakes. Because what hum- the human is to err. Mm-hmm. But you'll make mistakes confidently. And you'll ask for forgiveness confidently. Mm-hmm. And you live your life confident. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. is. Thank you so much. That's so insightful, huh? To human is to, to, to err is human. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. What um, have you learned? Yeah, in mm-hmm. line to what Mr. Tis just mentioned, mm-hmm. we are all subject to sin. Mm-hmm. Now I can agree. Uh, uh, the question is, are you able to recognize that you have done sin? Are you able to acknowledge that you've done sin and be able to be, of, to be able to return to God and ask him for forgiveness? Do you have that humility? Mm. Are you able to consciously go before God and ask for forgiveness that you may be forgiven of your sins? Mm. Yeah. I think it takes courage. It takes a lot of courage for you to, to admit that you're wrong, yeah? Mm-hmm. And to say that, uh, you know, God forgive me. God forgive me. But as you rightly say, it also takes a lot of humility uh, uh, to do the same, you know, to, to recognize that, you know, you're a sinner, you know, and that you're not that great, you know, and that you do things wrong sometimes. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what I have taken away from this lesson, you know, is that there is always an opportunity. There is always a room for you to change things. Right? As long as God has given you life eh, on a particular day, in a particular moment, there is always room for you to turn it around. You know? And really, that's the story. Yeah? And <laughs> ideally, the consequences, you know, we started by talking about consequences. Mm-hmm. The consequences of turning around, both, both immediate, delayed, <laughs> the consequences of turning it around is essentially victory. Victory. You will win. 
to quote Donald Trump, you'll win so much you'll get tired of winning. You might even say, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you might even say, please, I'm tired of winning, God, I'm tired of winning, you know. <laughs> but he's going to tell you, no, we must win more. Let's keep on winning. <laughs> Let's keep on winning. And really, that's the story. That's the story. The Israelites over here were trying things their own way, you know. They were trying it their own way. They were saying, you know, we can fight the Philistines. Bring the Ark of the Covenant. It will give us victory, you know, until they had to put their trust in God. And that's the only time that they were actually able to see results, right? And so i just like to admonish you and really just encourage you and tell you, you know, the only way you can do it is with God. There is no other way. There is no other way, right? And with those few words, I think uh, my name is Bismarck Lumumba. We've had a wonderful lesson together, and we wish you all the best as you go on. Uh, I'll just invite one of our panelists over here to pray. Uh, Seth, if you could pray for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of another quarter. Now, as you are departing, guide us, protect us, and give us a very wonderful week ahead of us. For this we pray, trusting, believing, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, and have a wonderful week.